Hello all and welcome to our panel. We'll just be getting started in a couple of minutes. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the 2021 EPIC Symposium. We will now progress to the panel, Buckling the Belt, Environment, Development, and the Belt and Road Initiative. My name is Arjun Padalkar, and I am a fourth year student in this year's EPIC class, majoring in quantitative economics and international relations. I'm joined by my fellow co-moderator, David Jang, who is a second year student in this year's EPIC class. In today's panel, we look forward to discussing China's environmental policies and climate leadership at home and abroad. We will be discussing how China will factor in environmental standards into one of the most ambitious infrastructure development projects in world history, the Belt and Road Initiative. China accounts for roughly 28% of global carbon dioxide emissions, which is roughly the same as the next three emitters, the United States, the European Union and India. To remedy this, President Xi Jinping has embarked on an impressive mission to be carbon neutral by 2060. The CCP has set ambitious goals to peak carbon emissions well before 2030 and aspires to radically cut down carbon funding. However, China's vast and expansive Belt and Road Initiative that has been signed by two thirds of the world's countries has been heavily criticized for accelerating ecological damage in host countries. This panel will delve into the nature of the relationship between China's environmental leadership and the Belt and Road Initiative. Can China's development and environmental goals be harmonious? What does the situation look like on the ground in some of the BRI signatory countries? I'd like to introduce David Jiang. Thanks, Arjun. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, I want to explain how the panel will run. For the purposes of encouraging as much discussion as possible, each panelist has been asked to give opening remarks of five minutes, and then we will open the panel to discussion among our speakers and then open it to the audience for questions and answers. Uh, we have a distinguished group of panelists today, and we will give a brief introduction about some of the work they have done in the context of our panel. In the chat, you will find a link to the symposium program with their full bios. We begin with Dr. Joyce Masuya. Doc Jo Ms. Uh, Dr. Joyce Masuya is the Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Environmental Program. Uh, Ms. Masuya has more than 20 years of extensive experience in international development strategy, operations, knowledge management, and partnerships across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Prior to joining the United Nations Environment Program, Ms. Masuya served as advisor to the World Bank's Vice President, East Asia and Pacific Region in Washington, D.C. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Masuya. Thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, thank you, Arjun, and uh, good morning, the panelists. I'm in Nairobi, Kenya, so it's afternoon here. Uh, I'm really delighted to be invited to this panel. But let me start uh, my opening remarks with actually a personal, a bit of personal perspective. Uh, I grew up in a country called Tanzania in the 70s. Uh, and, 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 and even then, uh, as a child, I did see firsthand the challenges of having intermittent electricity, water shortages, bad roads. I can go on and on and on. Uh, I have also lived in China, in South Korea, and now I'm in Kenya. What I'm coming to realize with my global experience so many communities in the world, and I would actually dare to say 
communities in the 60 or so countries that are part of China's Belt and Road Initiative, they will tell you the same thing, that they wish for the same thing, better roads, better electricity, uh, more reliable source of energy. They want a decent supply of water so their kids could go to school rather than go and fetch water. They want the roads and railways that can connect and promote trade across countries. So I've seen this personally, but I've also seen it uh, as part of my job, both in my previous employer, the World Bank Group, and now with the United Nations Environment Program. But we all know that, that there is a dark side to the expansion of hard infrastructure. Done badly, the environmental and social cost can tremendously be high. Big infrastructure projects often go hand in hand with pollution, waste, and in the greenhouse gas emissions that fuel the climate crisis. So the critical question becomes, how do we provide, <coughs> excuse me, for the basic needs of people without harming humanity's long-term ability to flourish as a species? We all know that the planet does not have a vaccine with the global population expected to grow by 2 billion people within 30 years, and with a triple planetary crisis of loss of nature, diversity, pollution, and climate intensifying, answering this question is one of the biggest challenges we face. How we finance the infrastructure projects of tomorrow is a central part of the answer. And China's Belt and Road Initiative provides a powerful example of some of the opportunities, but also the challenges that lie ahead. Worryingly, the largest share of the BRI's energy investments are going on power plants that burn coal, the dirtiest form of energy, and science has spoken. In fact, about 85% of BRI projects are linked to high levels of greenhouse gas emissions. If built, this would eat up a significant amount of the carbon budget we have to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. But there are positive signs that things are improving. China's overseas investments in clean energy have generally been on the rise. Its Ministry of Ecology and Environment has begun to classify BRI projects based on their environmental impact. Projects involving coal and hydropower, for example, face stricter controls and regulations and could end up being excluded altogether. China and its, an, its international partners have also established a green investments principle. Some of China's biggest policy banks have signed up to these principles. These are welcoming moves, but much more needs to be done. More BRI investments must be channeled into low carbon and inclusive infrastructure projects that boost resilience and strengthen nature's ability to improve human being. The incentive to do so is there. Investing in energy efficiency and renewables generate five times more jobs than equivalent investments in fossil fuels. This is particularly relevant given the current context. With the right type of green financing, the BRI has the power to play an incredibly, incredibly positive role in how countries recover from the economic and social harm caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. So to a larger degree, the BRI mirrors what we see with infrastructure investments around the world high level commitments to sustainability with mixed results on the ground. This is not good enough if we are going to meet the Paris targets and the sustainable development goals. A massive scaling up of investments in sustainable infrastructure is badly needed. With the recovery stimulus packages currently being put in place, governments have a real and unique opportunity to turn commitments, aspirations into action. They must not waste it. So I'm really excited to having a discussion as part of this panel. Thank you, David. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, next, we have Dr. Rishikesh Bandari, who is a postdoctoral scholar at the Climate Policy Lab at Tufts. 
He's an expert on climate finance and international climate negotiations. His research focuses on how developing countries mobilize finance from different international sources. His current work revolves around the deployment of renewable energy through the Belt and Road Initiative. Welcome, Dr. Bandari. Great, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you for organizing uh, this panel, uh, David uh, and Arjun, on this very important topic. Um, and thank you uh, to IGL for hosting these um, epic symposiums, which I know uh, we all look forward to. Um, so let me uh, just start by uh, you know, framing the discussion um, a bit in terms of uh, the basic point that I want to make here today, which is you know, often in the press, you'll hear um, calls on China to change its investment policies. And so in a sense, you could describe these calls as focusing on the supply, right? Sort of the supply of Chinese investments going out. And the point that I would like to make uh, here today is that in addition to this very important you know, discussion on supply, we also have to focus on the other part of the picture, which is the demand. Because if we do not think about the supply and the demand together, we are not going to get a comprehensive picture of what exactly is happening um, on the ground. So um, what does a demand-based uh, perspective um, tell us? Um, I would like to make sort of three general points on this. Uh, the first point is that we really need to focus on updating energy planning in developing countries. Um, most of the cold build out that we are seeing or that we have seen in the last decade of uh, the 2010s, that largely reflects the policy thinking, planning thinking that went into uh, effect in the early part of the decade, right? So, um, of course, policymakers um, were thinking about the economics of renewables versus coal uh, based on what the prices were um, almost 10 years ago. And so, um, if we are to make sure that we truly reflect the advances that have been made over the last 10 years, there has to be a systematic effort to update these plans. Of course, some of these are you know, already being done in the course of the new round of pledges under the Paris Agreement. However, there has to be a very clear focus on the energy set and the energy planning um, as well to make sure um, that these plans are truly um, up to date. Now, the second aspect is that we have to focus explicitly on renewable energy. And what I mean by that is, yes, there are calls, extremely important calls for there to be a phasing out of coal fired power plants. However, the assumption that is often found in those discussions is that simply stopping financing uh, from going towards coal is somehow going to automatically jump towards renewables. And that assumption, I think, is a little too strong and often is under the surface, but I think needs to be brought to the surface to be really examined critically. Because it may be true in certain instances where there is the fungibility of money that goes from coal to move over to renewables. But I would argue that it's not automatic and therefore there is substantial room for countries that host these investments to actually change their policies so that they consciously tilt the scale towards renewables away from fossil fuels. Um, so uh, a very conscious and intentional effort in focusing on renewable energy policies would be uh, my second point. Um, and finally, and this is what I will uh, close on, is um, we really need to foreground uh, what the needs really are, right? Because we're talking about you know, developing countries that have, you know, as was mentioned earlier in this panel, that have really real um, infrastructure, energy, drinking water, you know, a whole array of, of needs that really need to be filled. And so I think thinking about what the needs are first, rather than what the sources are, and a pretty dichotomous debate around whether it's Chinese or American or any other source of money, um, I think um, would really help us to think about how can we exactly meet these needs um, what would these sources of finance be there for would be a derivative or a sort of a secondary question once we foreground what exactly needs to be done um, on the ground. And so I think it's important for us to capture the nuances um, in a holistic way. Um, and I think really thinking about what exactly are the needs on the ground really has to be the starting point, I think, um, for these discussions so that we're able to think about these sources um, in a way that actually 
you know, truly reflects uh, what countries need on the ground. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Bandari, for your remarks. Um, our third panelist today is Dr. Elizabeth Lossis, who is a senior fellow at the Nicholas Institute. She is currently exploring how to plan for and optimize the environmental impact of infrastructure expansion in Asia, Africa, and Europe that is stimulated by China's new Silk Road initiative. Welcome, Dr. Lossis. Thank you, David, and thank you all for um, having me join you. This is a wonderful opportunity and great panelists to be speaking with. Um, it's this, the topic of your symposium is incredibly timely and anybody who has been reading the news in the last couple of days knows that uh, the tensions between particularly the US and China are uh, hitting a boiling point and often the environment is seen, particularly climate, is seen as one of the sort of potential bright spots out there uh, where there actually might be some global cooperation that moves us in a very positive direction uh, as compared to many of these other tough issues that the world is facing. And um, what I want to argue today is that with my points is that we actually may be at an inflection point, sort of building on the last two speakers and what the next speaker is gonna say, this actually could be an opportunity. On one hand, we could sort of, China could continue with the Belt and Road and business as usual, where they double down on a lot of the investments already being made, as we heard, investments in coal and otherwise, or this really could be the moment when there is a shift towards um, a lot of the types of investments that we just heard about in the last two talks. So what I want to do is uh, talk about three points. Uh, briefly, the first one is that actually China has already started to do a revision of the Belt and Road. They've already sort of looking at 2.1. The second point is that there is a global global movement, which might present an opportunity with the Build Back Better and this post-pandemic moment. And then finally, that there are some unique opportunities that exist that might allow this movement. But first, let me give a little bit more background on the Belt and Road. Um, the Belt and Road has been around since 2013. It was really the development of infrastructure lending that China was already uh, doing, but then became coalesced as the Belt and Road. And from the very beginning, there was this uh, piece of the Belt and Road, which is called a Green Belt and Road, and a movement China was promoting um, the movement towards eco civilization, which is embedded in China's five year plan. And the Belt and Road was going to be this wonderful people to people cooperation to reach that. And um, this President Xi has actually been very supportive of this. There was an analysis by um, Bloomberg Intelligence Services that showed that by 2015, his speeches to the uh, uh, Party Congress already used environment, the term environment more than economics or economy, which is sort of extraordinary. And indeed, beginning in say 20, uh, 12, there were a whole series of guidelines and decrees and social corporate social responsibility uh, standards around specifically the Belt and Road and more generally overseas lending that really put out aspirational environmental and social goals that if they were actually um, followed through would probably represent the most important uh, progressive environmental global agenda the world had ever seen. But what we know and what we've heard from previous speakers and we'll hear from the next is that on the ground that actually hasn't happened. There's a big disconnect between the rhetoric at the highest level and what's actually happening through Belt and Road on the ground. Uh, there are some bright spots, but there are a lot of issues, whether it's all the coal plants that are being financed or dams such as in Indonesia that is risking the uh, Banteng Toru hydropower project that is risking um, extinction of uh, orangutan subspecies or resource finance agreements in Ghana that link infrastructure 
with the development really unsustainable and very harmful, both from an environmental and health perspective of bauxite mining, whole range of these opportunities and why this why this discrepancy occurs, we can talk about, but I would say the uh, Chinese expression, the mountains are high and the emperor is far away, sort of sums it up that even though the central party is pushing this and it's really President Xi's agenda, those that are taking the action on the ground don't really feel compelled. Most of these guidelines are in fact that guidelines. So we can talk about that more, but I wanna mention these three points, which make one think that this could be an inflection point. First of all, China has greatly pulled back in its investment. The Central Policy Bank, which does most of the lending, their infrastructure lending has dropped by more than 90% since uh, 2016. This has been done quietly. China doesn't talk about this, but there's really been a retrenching. There's much more discussion of quality infrastructure rather than the initial push to just get infrastructure out. And right now, of course, then COVID came along and, and these uh, loans diminished even more. And so now what you see is this moment where BRI is likely to pick back up again, but perhaps in a different venue. Second of all, the global environment has also changed. Build Back Better, which was started by the UN in the Sendai Forum right now is seen, there's a broad consensus that infrastructure lending should move in this direction. And um, the Biden administration in particular is behind this. And interestingly, the Biden administration is focusing more on loans through this newly Trump created um, Development Finance Corporation, which sort of matches the BRI, whereas China in the last few years have focused more on assistance and just put out an important white paper this year, which sort of matches Western lending. So there's this moment where Western, whether it's the EU's Green Deal, South Korea's New Green Deal, the US has built back better, are beginning to sort of come into alignment in a way that China, which already has this green BRI blueprint, could easily join uh, in this. And then my final point is that this is a big year for the environment on the international stage. Um, the UN Environment Program has just in their recent Environmental Assembly put out some best practices for sustainable infrastructure. We have, of course, the, um, the, the global climate talks. And finally, and importantly, China is actually hosting the biodiversity talks. And we should not get so focused on energy that we don't see a lot of the impact on the environment and a lot of the health and human relations from ecosystem services. And so in Kunming, which is coming up this fall, China has a real opportunity to take that moment and really grab the global stage. So happy to go into any of these points more, but I will cut off there. Thank you, Dr. Losis, for your remarks. Um, our last panelist, but certainly not least um, today is uh, Dr. Jennifer Turner, who is the director of the China Environment Forum at the Woodrow Wilson Center, where she researches and leads dialogue about the energy and environmental challenges, especially relating to water, energy, and green civil society issues. Welcome, Dr. Turner. Hey there, thanks so much for having me. Um, I, I love having conversations with smart folks like this. Uh, yeah, so as you mentioned, I'm at the China Environment Forum and I'm very lucky because I have a kind of a front row seat working with Chinese NGOs, government researchers who you know focus on domestic greening issues, but also the Belt and Road. I'm gonna start out with a story, okay? A little bright light like Elizabeth was pointing out. Um, so a couple of years ago in July, 2018, a Chinese environmental uh, lawyer named Zhang Jingjing, she appeared in a court in um, Ecuador to support the Canary Quechua indigenous community that was trying to stop and close a mine that, that a Chinese company was building inside the Cajas nature reserve, which was actually illegal to build in a nature reserve, but let's move on. Now, 
it was it ended up being a historical decision. The Ecuadorian judge ordered the company to halt their mining activities because they had not consulted with the indigenous communities and obtain a, their permission. Now, the judge made the decision because Zhang Jingjing, uh, she's kind of like the Aaron Brockovich of China. She did a lot of cases in China against polluters and you know knocked down companies. And now she's taken it onto the road. Now the judge made his decision because she argued in court, and this is the first time someone ever succeeded in doing this, was that Chinese law requires companies abide by both international treaties and Chinese domestic law. And Zhang noted that China has signed the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and China has their own environmental regulations on environmental impact assessments, prior consent of communities, and none of that was done. So boom, the, the, mining, the mine, mining company couldn't had to stop. Now, this highlights kind of an environmental victory for a project that was poorly located uh, in terms of environmental and social impacts, but it also, it also highlights a kind of a growing trend I've seen over the past, um, you know, since actually since Belt and Road, even before Belt and Road started, um, but really 10 years ago, where uh, Chinese environmentalists, lawyers, researchers, and NGOs have been getting involved in kind of being watchdogs for China's overseas investments, but also empowering the communities where the investment is going. Uh, today, uh, Zhang Jingjing has been working with some environmental lawyers in Zimbabwe around a um, what's called the Sengwa coal plant, which is gonna be, I think, one of the largest in Zimbabwe. And some of the issues here is that in, in terms of you know, inadequate environmental impact assessment, coal-fired power plants, the ones that China's building are not as high quality as the ones in China. The ones in China are ultra super critical coal-fired power plants that, that you are 40% more efficient, use less coal, less water. But this one in, in Zimbabwe is, is, is gonna be one of those thirsty plants. Well, there isn't enough water nearby. So of course the Chinese can conveniently build a water transfer project that would be taking water from a transboundary reservoir. Breaking laws left and right, right? So, so, so Jing Jing's working on this space, but there are other organizations. I'd like to just, uh, there's one group that who I've worked with over the years called the Global Environmental Institute, a uh, Beijing NGO, kind of a think tank NGO. And they, they do the same kind of things like a lot of US and European groups that are looking at China's Belt and Road. You know, they do research, they're kind of tracking the investments, but you know, it was unusual to have a Chinese NGO that they're also tracking, you know, what is China doing in terms of coal fired power investments, how clean or dirty are these plants. But they also, their first project um, was in Africa where they, were, where they were working in Cameroon, Congo, Uganda, Mozambique, and they were doing journalist trainings and exchanges, bringing, you know, journalists from the region to China to learn about how to be better environmental reporters and wanting them to focus on China, Africa, timber issues. Cause there was a lot of cases, you know, a lot of China's BRI investments, building roads, building trains, opens up forests and then the timber companies can come in. Um, they also were doing research on export import laws and, and practices that, that were being violated in this kind of timber trade. And, and they've done other works in other sectors in terms like in Southeast Asia, they've been building the capacity of NGOs there to kind of be watchdogs for certain projects. But they also, they, they, the nice thing is with this, this group and there's some others in China that are also helping to build the capacity and understanding of the Chinese government of the environmental impact. So it's one of the bright lights that um, Dr. Los was talking, it's a different bright light I wanted to shine, is that there is this kind of like bottom up movement. And in terms of like another renewable energy, um, uh, WWF China and a Chinese group Green Innovation Hub, they've been doing assessments in Southeast Asia of what's the potential for renewable energy? Because um, Dr. Bandari said, these renewable energy projects aren't getting out, right? Well, they're looking at some of the obstacles and identifying opportunities. So in some ways it's, it's really exciting for me to see the kind of roadmap that Chinese NGOs are doing. Um, something that I could go into a little bit more in the Q and A, but I'll highlight here is that a lot of the problems with uh, BRI problems is that there's a lack of transparency. Agreements are, are made very quickly, so you don't have the environmental impact assessment statements. There's not continued community engagement. And there's even, I think that, that I'm sure, Dr. Bandar, you probably are frustrated with this. There's no good database on what even are the BRI projects. And there's a lot of like um, Boston University and, and WWF, all these people are gathering them, but the Chinese government itself doesn't maintain a list that shows who's bid, where is it, is there an environmental impact assessment? And that kind of transparency is gonna be crucial 
if we really want to green that Belt and Road. I will stop here and let's open up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Turner, for your remarks. Uh, now I'll pass it over to Arjun. Thank you so much, Dr. Turner and the rest of the panelists. Your, your remarks were so insightful and I'm sure that the audience would be racking their heads to uh, get questions in the chat. But while we, while we prepare for that, uh, we would encourage any uh, comments or questions um, between the panelists and themselves. We encourage any uh, questions or comments on what the other panelists have mentioned or any other interesting facts. Feel free to come off mute as well. If not, I also have an introductory question that we can get the ball rolling with, um, and it's something that connects it with uh, the recent times as well. So uh, China has recently announced its 14th five-year plan, which involves uh, significant changes to the economic roadmap of the country, uh, but that also has significant impacts for how uh, the climate considerations involved. So my question to the panelists is that uh, considering uh, development, which is a high priority for the Chinese government, how can they involve environmental impacts into their regulations? Can I kind of jump in kind of related to that? That you know, So the 14th five-year plan was, there's been talk that, the, that there's a little bit of disappointment in that it doesn't seem as kind of aggressive on climate as they would want. But what is notable is that the Chinese got, the 14th five-year plan still continues the war on pollution. Right, because that's been, and which is linked to the climate problem, right? When you were, if coal and car emissions are a big source of, of air pollution, but also a source of climate emissions. Um, and, and one area that I thought that, you know, that, that China is still emphasizing that um, is, uh, wasn't brought up yet today, but um, green ports. Have you guys heard about this? That, that starting, starting back in 2015, um, you know, China was having big problems because they, you know, they're the number one, you know, Shanghai, the busiest port in the world. So lots of air pollution. And of course there's diesel. So that is also greenhouse gases. And so China kind of, they started an action plan. And so they're having like a war on pollution from ports and they've done amazing work. Sometimes also work like Shanghai works with the port of LA to work on greening their port, not only shifting away, um, you know, they're requiring, you know, low sulfur fuels from boats. They have stricter standards on what type of fuel, you know, what that, that these boats can use. They monitor it very well. Uh, they also have more and more of their ports have what's called shore power, where when boats come in, they kind of, I picture a giant plug, they plug their boat in so they're not spewing diesel out. Again, cleaner and greener. And one question that I've been kind of pondering, and I'm, and I'm starting to talk with people at the Ministry of Transportation, like, how do you take this good, this is a good practice, right? They're greening their ports, the air quality is getting better, which has a good climate impact. How do you take this on the Belt and Road? And that, so I'm, I'm answering your question with a question, but it's, it's just, a, there are other examples of this in China too. They've been pushing building energy efficiency. Why aren't they taking that on the road? You know, so, so that there's a lots of opportunities, kind of like, you know, Elizabeth, I was thinking that that's another kind of opportunity where China could take some of their domestic practices besides renewables onto the Belt and Road. So I will mute here and let other people say things. Uh, Arjun, uh, if I may come in, uh, I would like to build on uh, uh, the previous speaker by giving two perspectives. Uh, I think one of the areas that probably we have not touched upon in this panel is the role of BRI countries recipient. I mean, we've talked a lot about what China can and should do. But I think we should not lose sight of the fact that BRI is a financing mechanism. And from what you see, including uh, in literature, particularly in developing countries, the recipient BRI countries do have a role to set the guardrails when it comes to regulatory environment, to negotiate on the kinds of financing um, tenure they want. And we see this, by the way, with traditional donors, what others call traditional mature donors. And China, when it comes to financing, particularly infrastructures, they're really a new kid on the block. What we are seeing, for example, in uh, some developing countries where you have sensible, uh, sustainable 
uh, BRI investments, the recipient country have a role to play in setting what the regulatory mechanisms should be, what the terms of financing should be, including environmental and social standards according to international. So we should not lose sight of the role of BRI uh, uh, recipient countries. And most of them, I think uh, the previous, uh, actually you, Arjun, alluded to, it comes to the tension between development and climate. You have limited budget. For example, I mean, uh, you look at a country like Kenya or a number of middle income countries, they have quite a significant poverty uh, population. The inequality story is just uh, daunting. Uh, and not to mention now that COVID hit and the, economic, the economics have slowed down, there are other multidimensional challenges. So when it comes to, uh, actually making choices, we have to keep on working with the recipient countries to actually help them build on good international standards. You mentioned the fourth year five plan and the previous speaker talked about, uh, about uh, a pollution. I would absolutely agree with her. I would actually give a specific example. I moved to China, Beijing in 2011 with my kids. And then I can assure you, even letting my son goes out to play soccer, was a daunting proposition because everything was very heavy when it comes to PM 2.5 indicators. They were really off the chart. But fast forward now as part of deliberate uh, uh, five-year plans, there have been improvements, but the scale of improvement and the pace of improvement has not been as fast. In 2019, we hosted our World Environment Day uh, celebration, global celebrations in China because of the progress that was made based on scientific data in a place where, like Beijing, where in 2011, the story was very, very different. What I'm trying to say here is improvements in environmental dimensions, particularly the transitional costs from, they take time. Uh, in Kenya, for example, what we are seeing, the cost of renewable energies with all good intention of upper middle class wanting to buy, they just can't afford it because it's still very, very high. So there is a cost implication of clean energy. And that's where, again, we can come and help to see how can we lower the cost so the demand and supply can actually be aligned. I'll stop here. Could, could I ask Joyce a question? I was wondering, well, or anyone on the panel. Um, I, I was... I was a, the Asia Society published a report, I was an advisor on it a little bit, and a report on, it was called, um, well, a, a report on the Belt and Road, uh, navigating the Belt and Road. And one of the recommendations was to, you know, kind of goes on with this need for transparency, but they had suggested, and I think they were, you know, they were suggesting to the Chinese government that they create a BRI project preparation fund so that they could, that would award grants and other support to, to less developed BRI applicant countries that would enable them to kind of com either conduct or commission kind of a needs and feasibility analysis reports. So that way that 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 it would because of course the Chinese companies will come and said we've done an assessment, right? And so this way to kind of create a third party mechanism and, and I, you know, I, I was kind of intrigued with this proposal because I'm like, hmm, so the Chinese government, would like, you know, because maybe they wouldn't recommend that they do the Chinese project, but I thought it was a kind of an interesting example of you know, building the very from the before the project starts, building the capacity of the host country to ensure that the projects are appropriate, bankable, and sustainable. Is this kind of a crazy sounding idea? I mean, I, 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 I don't think it's gone anywhere. But have you heard anyone talk? Any of you heard anyone talk about this? About, I mean, this is like before the Chinese company could even start the project, there has to be a grant to help them make sure that this is what the country wants, what they need, Dr. Bandari, right? <laughs> Uh, I mean, if I could chime in, I wouldn't say it's an off the chart uh, idea. I think what I would say is one has to look at what are the, I think uh, one of uh, Dr. Banari mentioned demand and supply, because frankly, even developing countries and emerging economies, you have quite a bit of diversity. You have, for example, countries that have matured and they're, they're comfortable dealing with international financiers, including development financing, uh, financial institutions that actually invest in infrastructure. So they do have in-house, if you like, capacity of doing EIAs, environmental impact assessment or social impact assessment, even before the project concept 
uh, idea has been matured. But you have other countries, for example, fragile states that just don't have the capacity. And that's where the grant mechanism would actually help to finance uh, uh, capacity building in recipient countries. I think the, the, the regulatory dimension, the laws and practices that are put in recipient countries are equally important, but not just the laws. The laws are great, but even better the compliance because you can have the laws on the books, but if dams are built, communities are affected, environmental standards are not followed, then you do need to take people to court. What we are doing in UN Environment, for example, we're working with the court system in different countries to try and strengthen the legislative experience. We do also convening, uh, 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 we do convene meetings between development countries so they can learn because most of the environmental international standards now, I mean, they're, they're quite well known um, and there is track record from different DFIs. Over to you. So if I can jump in here briefly, um, I think this notion of a project preparation facility, you know, makes a lot of sense when finance is distinct from the actual project. Um, and in many of these BRI cases, that's not the case, right? Where um, oftentimes they already have the finance there. And then, you know, so in a sense, it's far more bundled in terms of who does the procurement, you know, and uh, who is gonna finance. So I feel like uh, this kind of bundling is not necessarily the case uh, how commercial finance operates more broadly speaking, but I think in the Chinese context, it's a bit, it's a bit different. Maybe this uh, will be applicable as uh, the participants um, sort of um, broaden and in a bit mature um, uh, sort of direction have a you know, different sense of exactly how they would sort of do the commercial financing. Um, but I think where, and this you know, goes to, um, uh, Joyce's point about um, the importance of regulatory, um, you know, capabilities. Um, I think there certainly is a case to be made for, you know, equipping um, these countries uh, to be able to really um, enforce existing laws because we've seen in so many cases, and, you know, I can give you some examples, you know, for example, in Indonesia, where um, uh, the coal-fired power plants, uh, yes, you know, they did an EIA, um, you know, they um, on the books, but it wasn't really, you know, um, an EIA um, that you would really sort of um, be confident about, right? And so I think, um, and a large part of that is because of uh, the lack of compliance of existing policies. These aren't necessarily new policies, but this is, you know, existing policies on the books. And so I think some kind of a support facility to strengthen and enable the regulatory um, teeth, if you will, um, the countries have um, would I think um, make a big difference. But in terms of bankability, because Chinese you know, financing works a little bit differently than sort of, you know, the bread and butter, you know, DFI financing, I, I'm not convinced that there is a case to be made for, um, you know, bankability as, as sort of the way to, you know, get the um, financing facility to contribute. So, um... I will um, jump in now. There's a lot said there and I have a lot to respond, but I just wanna make four points, I think in response to all of these various comments. The first is uh, something that is implied by many of these points is that early stage upstream planning is critical, whether it's the coming up with an energy plan or strategic environmental assessment that perhaps is uh, cross borders. And um, a lot of these issues, if there was good planning ahead of time, would help uh, put in place what needs to happen. And actually making it happen isn't always the case, but if you don't have early planning, you're not likely to get there. And that is definitely a role that whether it's multilateral development banks or UN agencies or bilateral programs, even, I mean, this can be something that China can take on. For example, China and Brazil have put together a list of uh, infrastructure uh, that Brazil wants that China might be willing to finance if there's actually a plan ahead of time with uh, well thought out, 
regardless of what sector you're in. And ideally, it's um, done cross sector, you're really much more likely to end up where you want to be. And how that's done, there are lots of options. One possibility is there's actually a fund, a facility that was initially set up by the World Bank and is housed under the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, an endowment that, potent, that whose mandate is essentially this, although I don't think it's really doing much yet at this point, but that might be one place to really help do this planning. My second point, which is kind of going down at a much lower level, and I think following on Jennifer's original points is um, part of the problem and part of the problem with regulatory enforcement is that uh, a lot of these countries are not as familiar with Chinese projects and investments, even though they've been going on for a while. Um, there are cultural differences, there are uh, language barriers, and there's just not an understanding the uh, multilateral development banks have spent 30 years developing a system of safeguards and procedures and transparency to a large degree. Um, it works sometimes, it doesn't always work, but it's pretty clear what the process is. And it's more opaque with these Chinese uh, grants, it's not that uh, loans, investments, aid, all sorts of things. And it's not necessarily that China's trying to be. I mean, it's some levels there is a degree of uh, opacity that, that is desirable. But a lot of it is these state owned enterprises just, they have no uh, background with working with NGOs, working with a group like. Uh, some of these various local NGOs in country or local governments where they're, they work from the beginning, they hold participatory. Many of these companies are, are perfectly willing to do this. It's just, this isn't in their wheelhouse. And they also, the English might be the language of communication, but you're working in South America, say, where you know, you've got native Chinese speakers, native Spanish speakers, and just a difficulty in the exchange. So there's a whole level of trying to bridge that gap, perhaps with a stronger development of um, helping build up the capacity, both in China, but also in these many of these BRI countries to share experiences, to build up a community of practice, to build up a, a ability to uh, learn from each other. And then my final point is just going back to the original question. The original question I think was based more on domestic activities. And as you go, China goes abroad, a lot of the controls, a lot of the Chinese regulations don't apply for what Chinese companies, even state-owned enterprises are doing abroad. But one level which I think has the opportunity to um, really move forward is through the uh, industry associations, which have actually developed some very progressive social responsibility guidelines, but they're not enforced. Many of the member companies don't even know about them, but to work through the Chinese industry associations might be one way to really um, get some of these SOEs on board. Thank you so much, panelists, for your really invigorating discussion between yourselves. And I think that's been perfect time for uh, adding the questions into the mix as well. And a lot of the students are particularly interested with the impacts on the recipient countries. So I think we can begin with that as well. So our first question is from an EPIC student, Carlos, who asks, does the BRI provide tangible increases in social capital uh, in the countries where it is present? And to what extent do the Chinese train and hire locally? And please feel free to get off mute and answer the question. Sorry, can you repeat the, the, the second part of the question, Arjun? Yes, absolutely. It, uh, the question asks, to what extent do the Chinese train and hire locally in the recipient countries of BRI investment? Okay, thanks. So let me uh, tackle the, the second one, uh, the second 
bit of a question. It goes back to my point about regulation. Uh, I can tell you a number of countries that I know in Asia, but also here in Africa, because they have very stringent labor regulations. Like for example, for most companies, if you go to China and you want to invest, you have to do joint in uh, joint ventures, you have to uh, employ X number of Chinese. So some of the BRI recipient countries in their laws have actually put that. Rwanda is one of the countries, for example, where they do require actually uh, a locally made, uh, a local job cre creation, if you like, as part of uh, some of these uh, initiatives. On the social capital part, it depends how you, you define it. I mean, you look, for example, in a number of middle income countries, uh, you see quite significant inward investments, especially on roads, uh, energy plants, as well as dams uh, that are being discussed as part of the bilateral uh, financing program. And I think there were lots of questions about transparency and it's a valid point because a lot of data is a bit patchy. Sometimes actually you have to obtain the data from the BRI um, uh, recipient countries. Uh, but I think what also one has to be mindful of, a number of countries, uh, even pre-Cold War era, there have been relations between uh, China and, for example, some African countries. I mean, I remember in 1976, uh, uh, China financed uh, Taz Tanzania Zambia Railway. Um, even then, uh, despite uh, the language, and the, it wasn't packaged as BRI, but it was a massive infrastructure investment that actually covered two, uh, two countries, so to speak. So there is prehistory um, that now is evolving based on what we are seeing. Uh, we also see a number of problematic spots, for example, a couple of years in Ghana, uh, because again, the government then, the Ghanaian government then uh, signed some of the mining contracts, which were not very uh, transparent or clean. Uh, the local communities, including indigenous uh, communities were up in arms against our Chinese uh, laborers who were actually brought into the mining. And really what that demonstrated was the importance of uh, the BRI recipient country to drive the laws, the compliance, as well as to communicate to the masses what is in it for them, uh, especially if there are uh, laborers that are coming from other countries. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Dr. Masuya. And, and another question also uh, looks, to, looks to ask, what are the sort of incentive structures that could be used um, to help uh, allow the host countries to transition to a more green partnership in that? And the question is sent in by Elliot, who's also part of the EPIC class. I'll just jump in just kind of just speaking broadly because I know we don't have a lot of time. There's, <clears throat> I mentioned about the Chinese NGOs that have been doing work in other countries. Should also note that you have World Resources Institute, WWF, a lot of the big international NGOs, the bingos, right? They're, they have been doing projects in some of these host countries in, in, cert, in, in certain areas to also build capacity. I'm just kind of giving a broad brushstroke here. Um, and, and also doing, um, you know, and, and again, like the Chinese NGOs doing kind of watchdogging kind of work, because again, a little bit of naming and shaming of, of Chinese companies, but also sometimes telling good stories. I know, remember a number of years ago, Friends of the Earth did a big report early on in the Belt and Road Initiative and was very surprised that there were some companies, like there are some companies that went to Latin America and didn't build in nature reserves. And, you know, and, and so I think that, that the role of, you know, researchers and NGOs, think tanks, to get out the message that some of that is actually, is actually getting to Beijing. I mean, just at the beginning, how uh, Dr. Lowe's talked about how the Chinese government is has has a growing awareness that you know, it's it's not just bad press. It's also that they're discovering that when these projects go off the rails, sometimes literally, that it's an economic cost, right? It's this mining company that had to close. I mean, just think about all the money that went into that, and and you know, and there's rumblings within China that 
we got, you know, like particularly I think after COVID, like we got to, you know, the Chinese public, a little bit of growing awareness and it would probably be helpful if there was more that, that this Belt and Road Initiative is maybe a little costly and needs to be done better. If I can jump in on this point. Um, so in regards to incentive structures, I think the, the most important thing would be for the recipient countries to be very clear about um, their own policies, right, that are explicitly green. And um, now to give you an example, I did interviews in Indonesia and um, what one policymaker said was, if we ask for coal, they, they as in the Chinese, will sell us coal. If we ask for solar, they'll sell us solar, right? So I think the first step is to figure out, well, if you're going to, you know, very consciously uh, be encouraging sort of green growth, then I think that's the first step to making sure that whatever is coming in through the BRI uh, very much uh, supports uh, your own objectives as well. Thank you so much for that, panelists. I turn it over to David for asking the question. So this is a question from Carlos, a uh, member of our EPIC class. So could the uh, environment be an area of cooperation between the Biden administration or subsequent American administrations and China? Um, that was uh, sort of part of the point I was trying to make, but maybe did it rather rapidly. Uh, in my earlier remarks, this really is a moment. And uh, there are, the Biden administration has uh, really committed to build back better domestically, but the same policies with John Kerry, head of the, um, essentially, on climate for all sorts of uh, national security and other issues abroad really has this moment. But um, the EU is, is right there. South Korea has their, uh, their new deal. But also the important thing is all these countries are looking at trying to look at the post COVID recovery and lower income countries are really suffering. And if you look at where, even though there's an understanding that green recovery is important, these lower income countries are not putting money into that right now because I think generally they don't have it. And so it really could be a moment. It is almost a face saving because China has been so vocal about the green belt and road and eco civilization. It is not, it's a, something that everybody, it's a win-win on the geopolitical side. So if it's only about politics, there's a clear opportunity. Problem is sometimes economics, you know, there are a lot of other issues out there, but it's a real potential win-win if, if um, the parties decide to go that direction. I can, if I can, add, thank you, Liz, that's what you teed up. Something I wanted to say, uh, build on that. Um, so at the China Environment Forum, and I've been, as I mentioned, I've been there 21 years and, and a kind of an ongoing theme we've had is, is, is this cooperative competitors, right? On energy and climate between the US and China. And under the Obama administration, I mean, the bilateral government stuff was like a, a fantastic ping pong match. I mean, so many exchanges worked together on renewable energies, water energy nexus, and it was, it was kind of exciting, but underneath that and supporting it, for many years, you know, there's been ups and downs in our relationship. Um, you know, U.S. NGOs, think tanks, universities have also been doing a lot to to work with China, building their capacity. I mean, a lot of the big international NGOs have offices in China, and even the Energy Foundation has an office there. And so there's there is there, even under the Trump administration, there was still those groups, the non-governmental groups, continue doing their work in China a little slower. But I've been hearing from people. In, in China saying that, well, you know, the, it, it, I think you're right, Elizabeth, there is an opportunity, but I think that it's gonna be important that, that the US, you know, has to, Biden and Harris administration have to show that we're walking the walk, talking the talk on climate. And, you know, the talks that are going on with China right now, it's not, we're not, they're not exactly warmly embracing each other yet because of the politics, but, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the eternal optimist. I think that there, it could end to be that we have to kind of, instead of just two, maybe, you know, we probably might be coming together more with the Chinese on, in multilateral forms. But yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic. You know, at least we're all moving kind of in the same direction on that. But Thank you so much for that. And going off that same wave of optimism, uh, we have another question from our EPIC class. Uh, uh, 
Ben McLean who asks, uh, China gives off domestically the appearance that uh, they're a little bit hesitant about climate change, but touted internationally. Uh, you have detailed, however, that this isn't the case with the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, how has this affected how any nations view China's legitimacy when it comes to being a leader in the fight versus climate change? Well, I'll uh, jump in here uh, on this and just sort of reflect on the international climate politics aspect, right, which is China is very acutely aware of its share of global emissions. Um, and, and so therefore, I think within the political groupings, such as the group of 77 in China, I think China is very much aware and conscious of this. Um, and therefore, you know, um, very much uh, sees its responsibilities, um, international responsibilities, um, you know, they are taken very seriously. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, as um, um, developing countries sort of think broadly about, you know, um, what exactly is the architecture, you know, sort of going forward, I think um, there definitely is a very strong role uh, needed for China. But at the same time, I think there's also a um, an awareness of sort of China's unique position where um, maybe, you know, identifying as a developing country in certain ways, but at the same time, also, you know, aware of its own um, carbon footprint, it put, you know, it, it gets placed in a very unique position. Um, and, um, but I think it's, you know, very much aware of this and, um, and therefore has been able to, um, you know, take on these commitments that in many ways have actually um, broken the gridlock in uh, the international climate politics and therefore have actually helped to sort of, you know, keep the process moving, which is maybe what was, um, you know, one of the most sort of critical meetings before the Paris Agreement. Um, was the U.S.-China deal, right? And so I think there have been these instances where China, um, self-conscious of its impact, has sort of, you know, um, moved faster um, than, than sort of, you know, what was, I think, expected. Yeah, just if I could, I would absolutely agree with uh, the previous speaker. I think also uh, China has learned from some of the not so good media coverage uh, on its own reputation. I mean, I can give you three very specific examples uh, that we have seen some shifts, uh, explicit shifts in policies aimed at greening the BRI. Progress is a bit patchy, but at least the policy actions are there. One is the uh, green investment principles for the BRI were actually created by Chinese and international partners in the finance sector, including the city of Lon London and the World Economic Forum. Uh, the second is the China's climate finance guidance, which addresses the climate impacts of BRI investments. Um, and they have a website, the data uh, is still evolving, but it's out there. And then December last year, the Green BRI coalition backed by the Ministry of Ecology and Environment released a three-tier traffic system for BRI projects, which I alluded to in my opening remarks in terms of uh, identifying, segmenting the risks and ways to mitigate them. Over to you, Arjun. Oh. Can I interject one thing that's great that I'm glad you mentioned that, Joyce, that because early on in, in the Belt and Road Initiative, the Ministry of Eco, well, then it was Ministry of Environmental Protection was tiny role and it's another encouraging sign. I'm glad you brought that up. And I just <clears throat> wanna also point out something that I don't think we said this explicitly, but the Belt and Road isn't actually a real thing. <laughs> it's sort of anything that China wants it to be as far as overseas investment lending. And the fact that they don't have that list that Jennifer spoke about is actually purposeful that there isn't a, set of guidelines, this is what makes a Belt and Road project and this is what doesn't. And so therefore it can be kind of malleable. And in fact, right now the Belt and Road is being used to help address COVID and health infrastructure and even PPE. Uh, so it can be used in a way that is um, um, helpful and hopefully uh, that will include helping these countries with um, transitioning their economies. Thank you. I turn it over to David for a question about more regional impacts of the Belt and Road Initiative. Yes. 
So want to go in a bit more uh, specifics. Uh, we have a question from Julia from the Braz uh, international delegation from Brazil. Uh, what do you think is the importance of the BRI to Latin America, considering its reality and context? Can you also discuss a little bit about how you think the BRI will impact the environment of this region? Um, I can answer that quickly. It's uh, a really interesting question. In fact, Brazil is a huge uh, partner with China and probably I think does get more BRI, BRI money than any other country, uh, Venezuela, of course, also. Um, but it is uh, a little less, there's no coal investments right now in Latin America. There are different types of investments, a little bit more in transportation, certainly hydropower. Uh, so it's distinct and it's also distinct in that a lot of the uh, lending, say in Southeast Asia, has um, is linked with a very long-term relationship between China and these neighboring countries. So the relationship with Latin America is, is a bit distinct with certainly the Asian BRI countries and also even African. Um, and so I think it's become more, it's really been a real growth area. It wasn't initially considered part of BRI, but now it's one of the fastest increasing uh, areas and it's pulled back again a little bit in the last couple of years, but it is, um, it's, it's a very important relationship, particularly being in the backyard of the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. Okay. We also have uh, a question regarding Africa, the same way we did with Latin America. So since uh, Zara from the Kellyan delegation asks, since the announcement that Lamu Island is said to be the location for Kenya's first coal plant as part of China's export coal industry, the implementation has been met with a backlash from the environmental organizations, such as Greenpeace. Is uh, the United Nations environmental program also a part of that opposition movement? And uh, she would like to know a little bit more about what they are doing about it. Thank you. Thanks. So I will answer your question uh, in two ways. Uh, thanks uh, for the question. One is, as you know, we are, we are headquartered in uh, Kenya uh, since 72, I think. Uh, and our Secretary General, bigger picture from the UN side, has talked about uh, zero tolerance for fossil fuels, uh, building of new plants. I mean, the message is very clear. The science is very clear. Since Kenya is our host country and a member of UNEP, because UNEP is any international organization, we have member states, meaning governments. Uh, we pass on the same message in our bilateral programs. Are we out and about uh, in Lamu and uh, demonstrating like Simon Geos? No, because we have a policy dialogue engagement with the government and very, very regularly. So that has been our message, uh, which is consistent with what the science speaks. Over to you. So we have a question from uh, Professor Rockford Whites of the Fletcher Maritime Studies Program. Um, so he asked, do you think China's polar silk road strategy, adding an Arctic belt and road to the maritime belt and road will result in a significant increase in Arctic infrastructure developments of ports, port to land, intermodal transportation links, et cetera? Or is it mostly a public diplomacy effort to engage Russia and other Arctic countries, but won't result in much actual investments? I'll briefly answer that. Uh, first of all, yeah, thanks, Rocky, for that question. Um, I think there could very easily be, you know, a third option, which is China simply diversifying its transportation routes um, so that, you know, most of it's not passing through certain choke points um, in certain regions of the world, right? So I think there's also a different set of motivations that are shaping um, Chinese actions in regards to the Arctic as well. I want to just jump in here just to, should note that the, the Wilson Center has a polar initiative and they they look broadly both at the Arctic and Antarctica about some of the environmental impacts of the development and should note that uh, 
a few years ago that, that China did support the creation of a marine protected area in the Ross Sea, which is one of the largest marine protected areas to date. But then just last year, China and Russia both opposed the expansion of Southern Antarctica um, marine protected areas. And that's in great part because China sees, you know, they do a lot of krill fishing in Southern Antarctica. And so it's, China's gonna be really, you know, it's kind of, kind of tangential maybe to that question, but I think it's China's very active and uh, in terms of, you know, because of their interest in, in fisheries in, in, and I think in both North and South Poles. But if you're interested, you should go to the Wilson Center's Polar Initiative because they're the ones fluent on this topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Turner, for that response. And uh, David and I are cognizant of that fact that we have five minutes before we can conclude this panel. So we have one final question, which can be considered as, an, as a concluding question sent in by Yanis from the Greek delegation. He asks, considering that one of the BRI's fundamental goals is securing energy resources like oil and natural gas, and with China making huge investments in fossil fuels, in regions like the Middle East, Africa, Central Asia, and the Arctic, do you think that the BRI's current goals are in contradiction with the government's official environmental targets? And this is something that is we wanted to bring out as a, a conclusion of, an, of our panel, as a, a binding question that we wanted to bring out. So uh, happy to hear responses from all of the panelists as well. I'll break the ice here because I'm never shy. So I think that, I mean, in some ways that's the whole, the premise of, first of all, I should note, I do love the title of our event, the event, the buckling the belt, and I'm totally going to steal it just so you know, for my, one of my future meetings. Um, I think that that is the real challenge that he talks about that, you know, that, that it's, Xi Jinping has stated he wants to, he, you know, for years, he wants to be the green leader, the climate leader, but there is this inherent contradiction. But I think that across the panel today, a number of us have talked about how China is starting to pull, there's other things that are driving it to maybe pull back, but you know, they are, you know, they are the world's factory. They are, they are heavily resource um, hungry, but you know, I'm kind of, I'm hoping that this year will be the, the year of the carbon neutral ox. And that as they're reforming their, you know, they're working more on, you know, domestically that they're gonna, you know, the pressure on them to, 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 to walk the climate walk um, overseas is gonna be greater. Yeah, I'll just uh, jump in quickly to add um, that I think something we haven't sort of you know discussed uh, is that the pledges under the Paris Agreement, right? They're territorial emissions, so they're emissions arising from your you know um, sovereign territory, not from your investments in other parts of the world. And so I think we see this disjuncture in this debate mostly because of this conflation of you know, how the Paris pledges are structured versus what the expectations are. Now, there, of course, is um, right up there in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, um, you know, making all financial flows um, aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So I think the next step um, in this process really is to shift the debate towards greening all financial flows, regardless of, you know, whether they're in your territorial emissions or not. So I think, um, you know, the next sort of um, step in the process really has to be thinking about uh, your emissions in totality, uh, consumption, production, um, and everything. So not just, you know, your own territorial emissions. Uh, so I will chime in. Uh, I think as uh, some of the speakers mentioned, I am also an in eternal impatient optimist. Uh, so, as some of the speakers have mentioned, I think there is a bit of contradiction, but I'm also optimistic. If you look at uh, President Xi Jinping's announcement, I think it was from October 2020, on the targets of um, uh, China, carbon neutrality for China, I mean, they'll have to walk the talk for their own uh, reputation uh, globally. That's one bit that gives me hope. I think second is if you look at the BRI recipient countries, um, there are lessons and there are shifts. Uh, a number of speakers have talked about international NGOs that are located in developing countries, but I can assure you they're equally, if not more important, domestic NGOs that are watching this space when it comes to BRI and, um, for example, on the impact 
on uh, climate change, but also on indigenous communities as well as others. I think we've not touched the dimension of the job, the evolving job market in China, the labor uh, rates are going up and uh, some literature, including from Justin Lin, um, former chief economist of the World Bank Group, have suggested that as China is moving into the service sector, they will be looking for opportunities to actually uh, bring the low uh, income jobs outside China for job creation purposes. So sometimes I wonder what is the impact of that on BRI and therefore climate change. But I am optimistic because of the exposure, the transparency, as well as the lessons over the last uh, seven to 10 years. Over to you. I'll make some just, I guess I get the final remarks. I think at the end of the day, there's a conflict between the geopolitical and the economic gains. It's pretty clear, I think, from what we've said that China has a lot to gain in soft power and in international leadership to, to take this route, but there are clearly other factors at play. Some of them economically, it, aligns, for example, the development of renewable industries within China, clearly there's a lot to gain, but there are trade-offs. And at the end of the day, this has to be at the highest level of priority for the central government. And they have to be willing to work with international partners to put in the mechanisms so that way out there in with their SOE is negotiating, it's very clear that this is a very high priority. And, and then there's a real chance, but there's a lot of uh, factors at play. So we'll see what happens. Thank you so much, panelists, for your really insightful remarks. David and I would like to thank you for your time. Uh, we really appreciate the opinions and the ideas that you brought up here, uh, especially as all of you mentioned, this is a critical time. Uh, in the history, at least in our fight against climate change and uh, rapid deterioration. And I'm glad that we could convene this and uh, speak with these issues. Uh, we would like to thank the Institute for Global Leadership as well and the entire staff, the EPIC students, all family and friends that had the chance to join us today. David? So to our audience, uh, so the next panel will begin at uh, 12 p.m. Boston time and will address China's rise in the technology sector. So. Um, the information on the panel is in the chat, and we look forward to seeing you at 12. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.